everyone, this is Unit 5, Lecture 6, Intro to Intelligence. Um, it's a big one. It's a big one. I would say it's like medium to understand um, in terms of the hard or easy. You can see there's a lot of learning targets, so that definitely is something that um, makes it a little bit harder, but we can handle it. Um, this is something we're going to talk about in class, but I guess I should start with it anyways because it does set up the rest of the discussion. Um, one of the big controversies about intelligence is, is intelligence a single overall ability or is it several specific abilities? So when we are about to go through a bunch of theories, um, it's really hashing out what the psychologists of um, the past and of today believe. Um, you can decide for yourself. This is not necessarily um, a right answer situation, but there's certainly evidence that seems to veer one way versus another. And then another controversy that will come up towards the end of this lecture is, um, can we locate and measure intelligence in the brain? In the same way we asked ourselves, can we measure and locate memory in the brain? Is this something we can actually pinpoint from a scientific perspective, or is it all just based on theory? Um, so let's get into what intelligence is. By definition, for our purposes, it is the capacity to understand the world, think rationally, use resources effectively, um, potentially to adapt and um, analyze different information, um, specifically when faced with challenges. Now in research, in the research type, um, what's the word I'm looking for, domain, in the research domain of psychology, it is considered to be whatever test measure, whatever standardized test measure. Um, and those skills tend to be school smarts. But does that, is that something you agree with? Um, is intelligence purely what you learn in school and can demonstrate on a standardized test? Again, conversations we'll have in class. Uh, overall, it is a concept. It's not a thing, meaning um, it's basically up to society to decide what it is. Um, it could mean who is successful or what sort of skills do you need to be successful. Um, in a different culture, it could mean who takes care of their family best who is able to grow crops the best, um, design something on um, with coding the best, you know, whatever it may be, it can vary by culture. So we are, um, in psychology, it does tend to mean um, intelligence tests. Um, but again, that's part of the controversy that will be covered in this lecture. Okay, kind of the, I'm not going to say the father of intelligence, but one of the first people to come up with a theory on intelligence was Charles Spearman, and he came up with this idea of general intelligence. And he believed that there was a single general factor for all mental ability called the G factor. And we're going to get to that in just a second. Um, but it's the idea that people, while people might have specific talents, they can all be kind of boiled down to or put together into one measurable number, one factor. So everyone has a single level of intelligence um, and it's up to psychologists and some of the tests to figure out what that is. And so this G factor, G, sometimes it's just regarded as G, FYI. Um, G is that score. It's kind of like the original version of an IQ, which we'll get to in the next lecture. Um, but G is a single score of intelligence as a result of a factor analysis. And this concept of factor analysis will come up here in intelligence and in personality and possibly some other parts of our curriculum, just a little fuzzy on where. Um, but for sure, intelligence and personality. And it's a statistical procedure, so it's a test um, that identifies clusters of related items. So it's going to test things like, and you don't need to know these, but just to give you an idea, it's going to test things like fluid reasoning, knowledge, quantitative reasoning, like math skills, visual space, spatial processing, um, some elements of working memory, short-term memory. So it's going to take all these ideas and um, I want to say it's like 56 questions of stuff. Um, and it looks for patterns and clusters of if they do well here, then they do well here. And if they do low here, but do well here, what does that result in? A G factor. And so while Spearman did understand that there were all these different things that could be tested, they ultimately came down to this one measurement. On the other hand, um, L.L. Thurston, Thurston um, was a critic of Spearman. And he's like, no, 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 no. 
there's not just one type of um, intelligence that people actually have seven primary mental abilities. And that's the name of Thurston's uh, theory. And we do need to know both the, the psychologist and the theory that they developed. So in this unit, be very um, certain to study both the name of the theory and the person. Um, he believed that these were the seven primary mental abilities, word fluency, verbal comprehension, spatial ability, perceptual speed, numerical ability, and inductive reasoning and memory. So honestly, a lot of the same ideas as Thurston, I'm sorry, as Spearman, only Thurston really thought that they were more separate abilities where Spearman was like, no, 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 all these things boil down to that one G factor. On your screen are famous examples or famous are examples of famous people who would probably score highly in multiple clusters um, based on um, Thurston, Thurstone's primary mental abilities. But you need to ask yourselves, are they um, scoring that way or would they hypothetically be scoring that way because they're all around intelligent people with um, one really strong score of intelligence or is it that they have all these independent skills that just happen to um, be embodied in the same person. So hopefully you can identify at least one person on my screen and you can think of uh, reasons why they are um, examples of this concept. We'll talk more about that in class. Ultimately though, um, researchers trying to distinguish is Spearman right or is uh, Thurston right determined that those who scored in one cluster tended to score well on other clusters. And so even though we could identify skills in seven different areas or more, it all boiled down to one level of intelligence. Um, if you think of someone who is athletic, they're generally not just athletic in one sport. They might not be a superstar in more than one sport, but if they have good uh, bodily spatial awareness, they might excel in one area and the other. Think about that like with intelligence. You might be strong in one area, but if you're strong in one area, it's probably gonna support your intelligence in other areas as well. And just when we seem to have a conclusion that, okay, intelligence is based on onto one uh, G factor, or one, it's one measurable concept, we have another psychologist that argues otherwise. And this is Howard Gardner, um, and he developed the theory of multiple intelligences. And this is pretty popular in the teacher world. So there's a chance that you've heard of some of these before. Um, but he basically said that intelligence does come in multiple forms and they are independent of each other. They maybe support one another, but each intelligence does stand alone. And he looked at people with brain damage um, as proof that even though someone might have brain damage where it hurts their verbal abilities, um, they might not lose their bodily spatial abilities. I'm going to give you more on that in a moment, but let's take a look at the intelligences he believed exists, or he currently believes exists. Um, and he believes that there are nine different ones. And feel free to read all these descriptions yourself, but I'm going to go through some examples of the different types of people who are considered to be very strong in a certain type of intelligence. And I think it will help you understand where Gardner is coming from. Mind you, I'm not convinced I agree with Gardner, but this is where he's coming from. So he would say someone like Frida Kahlo um, is a spatial, has spatial intelligence because she's a, a very um, outstanding artist. John Audubon is a naturalist. He started most of our, um, our national parks. John Legend, Einstein, William James, Oprah, Serena Williams, Maya Angelou, and Anna Freud. Um, I probably don't want to go through, I don't want to make this really long by going through each and every one, but you can take a look and see why does this make sense? Why is this person an example of each of these things? Let me talk about William James. He is one of our founding psychologists, and he is considered an example in existential intelligence. And it's basically almost like um, the philosophical questioning of life and who are we? What are we? What does it mean to be human? What do we experience when we live? So a psychologist who's all, who really focused on like the core of what it means to be human. Um, and then interpersonal understanding relationships between people, intrapersonal, oh, sorry, intrapersonal understanding uh, within a single person and then bodily kinesthetic, 
and then linguistic. And I think most of those speak for themselves. Now to get into the evidence that Garner was talking about in terms of how he's trying to prove that multiple intelligence exists, he actually turns to, besides someone with brain damage, he turns to the concept of a savant. And what a savant is, is someone with a very high mental ability in one specific area, but significant deficits in others. So perhaps someone who is um, autistic, who is a phenomenal um, artist, like you'll see in this video that we'll watch in class, um, but maybe has very poor verbal skills. So they uh, maybe they have a strong memory, but then um, are very uncomfortable interacting with people. So the fact that someone can be genius level, like off the charts amazing in one field and actually quite, quite low, not just normal, but like low, in other um, mental abilities kind of proves, or to, according to Gardner, proves his idea that people have multiple intelligences. And yet another theory is the triarchic theory of intelligence by Robert Sternberg. Um, he kind of overlaps with all of these thinkers so far, all of, the, all of these um, psychologists so far, in that he does believe that people have three different areas of intelligence, but that they too can overlap or you can be stronger in one and weaker in another. And that depending on those combinations, there's actually seven different types of intelligence. And so the three areas are analytical, um, more like your school smarts, your school skills, um, creative, so the ability to adapt, generate um, unique and novel ideas, um, and practical intelligence where you're just really good at handling everyday tasks and um, maybe like, like street smarts. Um, and so as I was saying, he believed that you could combine these in different ways or that different people would have um, different quantifiable levels of each of these three, and it would result in seven different types of intelligence, which you don't need to know all of them, but you do need to know one. I'm gonna point it out in just a moment. So he believed that a person purely based on the degree of strength of these types of intelligences would either be an analyzer, a creator, a practitioner, so really dominating in any of the three that he listed, or someone who's an analytical creator or creative practitioner or an analytical practitioner where you're combining two of these as your strengths, but overall the most effective type of intelligence would be uh, to be a consummate balancer. So this is the one I'd like you to know. So someone who's able to apply all of the three intel intelligences as needed. So not only has all three intelligences, they're all strong and someone can kind of tap into that part of their brain as needed. That person would be in the best position to make a valuable contribution to society and would essentially be the most successful type of human. Um, which again, this is another one where we're separating out different types of intelligences, but then trying to bring it together um, for the most well-rounded person being, being an example of someone with intelligence and who's likely to be successful in society. And now on to my favorite, though the one that probably fits the least with all of these theories, and that is emotional intelligence, also known as EQ. This is a theory developed by psychologist Daniel Goleman. And he claims that emotional intelligence is a set of skills that underlie the, underlie the accurate assessment, evaluation, expression, and regulation of emotions. In other words, the most successful people are actually not necessarily, they could be, they're not necessarily academically intelligent, but they're very good at managing their emotions. And we'll go through the components on the next slide, but these are people, if you have a high EQ, you're going to have successful relationships. You're gonna have a successful career. You're going to be successful parents because you know how to manage people and that that's the most important type of intelligence. He believes the components are perceiving emotion. So recognizing what you're feeling and being able to recognize it in other people. Understanding emotion. So once you've identified it, why is it happening? Um, how could it change potentially? Then managing it. What can you do not to manipulate, but what can you do to handle emotions in different situations, whether uh, really 
um, positive and joyful or really devastating and sad? How can you help others with them, with those things? And how can you manage them in yourself and help control your own emotions? And then finally, um, how can you use emotions to best adapt or be creative in all sorts of situations? And here we are at a chart that compiles all of it. And this is not something you should copy. It is a good tool, so feel free to check yourself um, before you wreck yourself. If any of this stuff doesn't hasn't uh, clicked, you can just give yourself a quick um, skim here to check on any one of your understandings. But I'm going to focus, I'm using this chart mostly to fo focus on other considerations, which I'm calling critiques. Each of these theories, um, there are skeptics and critics of each of these theories. Um, and so go back and take a quick look at all of them and make a note to yourself about what some of these are. Um, with Spearman, it's the idea that humans are so complex, how could we possibly just have one type of intelligence? With Thurstone and Sternberg, the critiques are basically that, um, okay, hey, cool, you're acknowledging all these different types of intelligences, but the data keeps showing that um, everything comes down to a certain type of verse, uh, type of in, uh, intelligence. We're talking about intelligence, not personality. A certain type of intelligence anyway, so maybe there is a certain G factor. Um, Gardner and uh, the emotional intelligence theories are both critiqued for the fact that um, are these things that they're talking about really intelligences? Are they just personality strengths? Are they just talents? Um, does it really stretch that idea of intelligence too far? The last Mm, is it the last? I don't know. The close to last major topic here is how does the brain neurologically relate to intelligence? Like, can't we just like measure a brain and be like, oh, this person's really smart because their brain is huge. Doesn't quite work that way, but maybe a little bit. Studies show that people with high IQ scores um, perceive stimuli faster, can retrieve from their memory faster, and have faster response times in general. And so maybe that shows us that neural connections that can act quickly um, belong to those who are intelligent? Or is it that people who are intelligent um, develop stronger neural connections? So we don't necessarily know which one comes first. Um, what neuroscientists have determined is that the density of the brain matters, not the overall size. Um, and that because of the density, it means that there's lots of extra neurons firing at any given time and someone can think or um, process information very, very quickly. And so it's not exactly about the size of the brain, but of course, I'm going to counter myself um, and say, yeah, intelligence can maybe actually be neurologically measured um, through brain size, even though I just said I couldn't. Um, there is some correlation. It's approximately a positive 0.5 that the um, larger the brain size, the higher the IQ, and also that brain size decreases with age as done it does nonverbal intelligence scores so maybe that tells us something um and brain size though is influenced by things like genes nutrition and environment so what does that mean for intelligence so i'm not i know i'm not giving you a whole lot of answers concrete answers here um but again these are things that psychologists consider a uh, fun fact einstein's brain was 15 percent larger in his lower parietal lobe um than your average person. So maybe, yeah, brain size matters. But on the other hand, other parts of his brain were smaller and it took him um, a lot longer to learn how to talk, which maybe is a sign of lower intelligence. Um, but other people say that more gray matter, so this denser level of gray matter is linked with high IQ because it's also the same area where we hold memory, attention, and language. You like how I'm not really giving you any answers today on anything at all. Um, let's break it down to just about the last concept. Wow, this one's longer than I thought. Um, and that is the difference between crystallized intelligence and fluid intelligence, which are the two types of intelligence. So crystallized intelligence by definition means that wisdom, the knowledge for hard facts, maybe some of your um, semantic memories, if you will and that someone has crystallized intelligence as they accumulate facts and skills through experience. You live a lot, you learn a lot, you read a lot, um, you're in a lot of classes, you're going to develop over time a lot of crystallized intelligence. Therefore, older people probably have much more crystallized intelligence than someone who's in their 20s or 30s. However, their processing might be slower. And that is fluid intelligence. So the ability to decipher information, make decisions, 
um, maybe even learn new things like technology. It's more difficult at old age, or in other words, does your, your fluid um, intelligence actually decrease with age? So on the one hand, you know a lot more stuff because you've lived a nice long life and acquiring tons of knowledge, but then can you access it and can you use it? The last, I promise, the last thing I want to talk about is the Flynn effect. And this is an overall idea that in the course of humanity, we've all become much smarter. And that intelligence scores um, continue to increase with time. Um, we're going to talk a lot more about why. I feel like this lecture is long enough, so we're going to save that why question for class. And if I don't mention it, please make sure you ask me. Um, but I feel like this is good for now.